Um, I think as the, the lead pastor, one of the most important things I can do is express to you at times um, how I don't measure up. Because here's what I know you all think. When you all see me, I know you think, that's a guy who's perfect. He's got it all together. He knows what he's doing. Um, he's, he's in great shape. He doesn't have a little belly that he can't get rid of no matter what he tries. Um, he doesn't have a head full of gray hair. That's not him. He's a perfect person. Um, he's really smart. He always reads things correctly. Like when he reads the Bible, he always says it the right way. He never butchers what he's reading. I know that's what you think. Uh, I know you guys think stuff like um, he never makes any wrong decisions. That man, he never makes a mistake. He never falls short in any way possible. I know that's how you think. I know that's how staff thinks. I know that's how my family thinks. I know for sure that's how my wife thinks. So I think it's important for me at times to express to you the ways that I don't measure up, okay? So here's some things that are bad habits of mine. These are habits that I wish I could stop, but I haven't been able to. And here's, you might have some of these bad habits. Um, one thing I do is I bite my nails. Anybody else bite your nails? Other people? Okay, some people. I can't stop and I won't stop, okay? I just, it's not possible. If you look at my nails, I never have any nails. I'm always biting them. But another thing I do, which is really weird, and I don't know why, and I've tried stopping, I can't. My wife points out to me all the time, is I chew my fingers. Like if you, after service, you want to come see, I chew my thumb and my pinky like this. When I'm focusing, when I'm writing my sermon, I'm just like this, chewing the whole time. And I don't know why. It's really weird. And Erica's like, are you a child? Are you sucking your thumb? What's wrong with you? So I do that all the time. I can't stop. Um, I eat too late. Um, I've, I've said that this entire series, but the reason why I eat too late is because uh, food's delicious after 9 o'clock. So I eat too late. I eat either chips, that's my go-to, or I'll eat like um, every Christmas we get a lot of candy in our stockings, and because of that, I've been eating hot tamales every night um, since Christmas, so after 9 o'clock. Um, uh, I, I stay up way too late. I, liked, I would want to be a person that gets up earlier, but um, I just like staying up late. I'm, I enjoy it. Um, and then when I do go to sleep, I always have my laptop on my lap and I watch a show or, or YouTube or something to make me, make me fall asleep. The reason why I do that is because when I grew up, my parents allowed me to have a TV in my room because my parents are cooler than your parents. So I'm just used to it now. So um, my wife hates that I'm always watching a laptop, but it just helps me fall asleep really easily. Those are some of my bad habits, uh, but these are they're fairly harmless bad habits that, that I just told you. Um, they're not good for me. I don't want to do them. But it's not life or death if I bite my nails or don't bite my nails. It's not that big of a deal. But I've also had other habits that are dangerous for me. Uh, one thing that I've struggled with since high school and something that I will always struggle with because of how long of a habit it was, and I bring this up, I brought this up before, but I've struggled with pornography in the past. That's not just a habit that I hope I stop one day. That's a dangerous habit that if you do not figure it out, it's going to do things. So because of that, I have safety measures and guardrails in my life. My phone, my, my wife has a code on it that um, I can't just go to any website. I do all that because of a bad habit that I've had in the past. And all of us have bad habits. Some are harmless, like I talked about, that you just like to change, but it's really not that big a deal if you don't. Maybe for you, it's leaving dishes in the sink. Maybe for you, it's not making the bed in the morning. Maybe for you, it's hitting the snooze button one, two, seven, eight times, however many you do. Some, but some of our habits are dangerous. And if we don't eventually change it, it will do major damage to us. Maybe for us, it's we are just physically unhealthy. Not just we don't work out enough. Like we are physically unhealthy where it's robbing years of our life because of how unhealthy we are, because of what we eat, because of how little we work out, because of how much water we drink or don't drink. For some of us, it's smoking, that we know that over time, this is going to ma have major damage. It's a dangerous habit. For some of you, it's pornography. For some of you, it's substance abuse, like alcohol or drugs or pills. We all have different habits that we are trying to break because we're all different. But here's what I do know. None of us plan to have these bad habits. None of us get to a point where we're like, you know what? That's my goal, to have that bad habit. No one says, you know what? My goal is to be financially unstable. That's what I would love to do. I don't want to be generous. I don't want to save anything. I want to live way beyond my means. I want to be in debt for the rest of my life until I die and pass it on to my kids. That's what I want to do. No, none of us say that. None of us say, you know what? My goal is to be negative all the time. I just always want to be the negative person. When you're around me, it's like, you're having fun? Come to me, because I'll make sure that I'm going to put a damper on this. I'm always negative. I'm always the victim. That's me. I, I, drama always surrounds me. I don't know why. It's, I don't know what the common denominator is, where drama always is. Maybe it's me. That's, none of you say that. None of us go, you know what? My goal is just to become addicted. I just want to be addicted to whatever it is. I want to destroy my marriage in the process, my relationships, my family. I want to destroy my job, all because of my addiction. None of us say that we have that goal. 
and let's not get so extreme here, none of us say, you know, my goal is to work for years in a job that I don't really care about, that I have no passion about, that gives me no purpose and pleasure until I retire one day and count seashells on a seashore. None of us think that either, do we? None of us say that's our goal, but a lot of us, that becomes our goal. If none of us want these bad habits to happen, and none of us plan for them to happen, why do they happen to so many of us? Why does it continually happen? Because, as we've been learning throughout this series, it isn't a goal problem, it's a system problem. Throughout this series, if you haven't been here, we've been um, using two things. We've been using Atomic Habits uh, by James Clear. If you are looking for a book to help with your habits, I highly, highly, highly recommend getting that. Some of you have gotten it and told me that, it's, that you've been loving it. It's a great book. A lot of what we're talking about is going to come from that. And we've been using um, a, a sermon series by Craig Rochelle called Habits. And in it, here's what we've been learning. Developing godly habits produces a godly character. That if we want to be a godly person, if you're here and you say, I, I want to be a closer follower of Jesus, and that's who you want to be, developing godly habits produces a godly character. If we want to be the best version of ourselves, if we want to be that person, we want to be the person that God is calling us to be, we need to be disciplined. We need to develop and build godly habits that in turn will produce a godly character. So we've been talking about this entire series. And so far, all we've really talked about is habits that we're trying to start. What are some godly habits that you're trying to start that maybe you've tried to do in the past but haven't been able to keep up with it or, or you decide, no, I'm going to start doing that now. Throughout this entire series, that's mainly what we've, what we've been talking about. But today, we aren't going to focus on what you need to start. We're going to focus on the habits that you need to stop. Those habits that are keeping you from being the godly person you want to be. Those habits that are not helpful in your life. Those habits that you don't want to do. What are those habits that are keeping us from being our best selves? In Paul's letter that, um, in Colossians, Paul talks about how to be a follower of Christ who lives very practically. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to, to Colossians chapter 3. We, we, we'll be reading 1 through 13. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Here's, let me take a break here. Here's something that we tend to miss. Nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Gospels, nowhere in Paul's letters, do we get any indication that you can follow God conveniently, that you can follow God partially. We don't get any indication of that in the Bible. Following Christ always starts with death. It was His death on a cross that gave us the ability to be connected to God. So we are to follow in His footsteps, like Christ said, to pick up your cross daily and follow me, to deny ourselves, to die to ourselves. It always starts with death. Because of Christ's death on a cross, we now decide to die to ourselves, to our old self. Not compromise with it, not keep it around just in case, kill it. It's over. We're done with that. The old self is gone. It starts with death, and then from death, we are raised to life again. It's like Jesus was raised to life again to show that your sins have actually been taken care of. We are called that from death, which starts with that, we are to be made new in our resurrection. Because Christ rose from the dead, we too can rise to be made new and alive again. And since we are alive in Him, we set our minds on things of Him. Not our old self that we're trying to kill, but our new self in Him. What does that mean and what does that look like practically? Well, Paul gives us some practical examples in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. We don't live that way anymore. These ways that he listed, we don't concern ourselves with those things anymore. Why? Because we're new. We are made new in him. We are new in Christ. We don't live by our old sinful ways anymore. Those are the things that, we, that, put, death, that put Christ on the cross, so we choose to put it to death in our life. And you might see that list and be like, yeah, that seems like a really hard way to live. And it is. Of course it is. Dying to yourself in a culture that says yourself is the most important thing is a hard thing to do. But that is what Christ called us to do. Deny yourself, 
take up your cross daily and follow him. In him we are new, so why would we settle for the old? In him we are free, so why would we live in chains? In him we are being made holy, so why would we live in sin? He continues on in verse 7, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. That's how you used to live. You used to live by your sinful nature. You used to live with yourself as number one priority. You used to live that way. You don't live that way anymore because you remain new. That isn't you anymore. And then Paul gets practical again. He starts listing bad habits that we should stop. And here's what he says in verse 8. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. You are a new creation. So Paul says, act like it. Stop bad habits that produce anger and rage. Stop the bad habits that, of talking badly about somebody else. Stop the bad habits of what you say. Stop the bad habits of not being disciplined. Stop the bad habits of insert the bad habit there. We stop those bad habits. And what do we do instead as God's holy people? Paul tells us in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has, have any grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We all have habits that we want to start based on who we want to be. But your bad habits can get in the way of those good habits. Those bad habits can get in the way of who you want to be. That's what can happen. Good or bad habits, they always give you a result. The good habits you start with, they will lead you to successfully be the person you want to be. But the bad habits, if you don't stop them, can lead you to, be the, to fail to be the person God has called you to be. So understanding that, because you understand who you want to become, that person you want to be, understanding that, my question for you today is what one habit do you need to stop in order to be the person you want to be? Now, I know when I say that, you're like, well, I got 30. I'm like, I'm with you. I got 32. We're not going to focus on 30. We're going to focus on one. One bad habit. Because if you focus on 30, you're not going to get any of them. What one bad habit is preventing you from being the person that you want to be that right when I said it, you knew the habit. You knew exactly what I was talking about. What is that one? Maybe it's unhealthy. Maybe it's unhelpful. Maybe it's ungodly. But what one habit do you need to stop? Here's how this gets tricky. Good habits. Good habits are hard to start, but they pay off later. Bad habits are easy to start, but they hurt later. Let me give you some examples. When you go to work out, if you've never worked out before and you decide, I'm going to start working out, it's not fun at first. You, try going, you ever try going running the first time and you haven't ran in like three years? It's not fun. You don't enjoy it. When you go to the gym the first couple of times, maybe at first it's okay, but after that second week, you're like, ah, this is, why do people like this? Why do people pay money to go here? Why, why would you do that? It's hard to start, but then after a while, you start to see, oh, I feel better. Oh, I, I look a little better. I actually kind of enjoy it. It's good habits are hard to start, but they pay off later. Another one, maybe for you, it's, it's getting plugged into a new church. Listen, it's not easy at first. I get it. You come to a place that a lot of people already know each other, and you're like, I'm going to try to start coming consistently and get to know some people. Maybe you decide you're going to start serving or being part of a group. And at first, it's hard to get plugged in. Good habits are hard to start. But over time, you eventually be like, oh, wait, I'm actually growing in my walk, and I didn't even realize it just from being here. That's what happens. Good habits are hard to start, but they pay off later. Where bad habits, you know they're easy to start, but they hurt later. Maybe for you, if you smoke, you know it was easy to start. It relieves stress, easy to do, but later on in the years, you're going to see the damage. You know that. It takes money out of your pocket. It takes years off of your life. You smoke a pack a day, you're spending over $2,000 a year on cigarettes, and you're taking off literally years of your life. You understand that. It's easy to start, but it's going to hurt eventually. Maybe for you, you stop doing your spiritual disciplines. At first, it's easy. Like, it's a break. I don't have to read every day. I'm not praying, and I haven't really missed it. It's easy to start. But then over time, you start to be like, oh, wait, I don't feel like I have much of a faith anymore. I don't feel like God's that close to me. And you start to realize the damage over time. So understanding that, how do we break bad habits? Two weeks ago, if you were here, Michelle talked about uh, the habit loop. And we got this straight from Atomic Habits. Here's what the habit loop looks like. It says this, Q, 
craving, response, reward. That is the habit loop. That if you, um, whatever, any habit you have, it goes through this. Cue, craving, response, reward. The cue triggers a craving. The craving motivates a response. The response provides a reward, and the reward becomes associated with the cue. Let me give you an example. You see a cookie, that's the cue. You see it, it triggers you. Um, you say, I want to eat that cookie. That's the craving. You eat the cookie, that's your response. The reward is the cookie was delicious. Next time you see the cookie, you're going to think about the reward. Oh, I know how that cookie tastes because I had one. It's delicious. I'm going to have another one. That's what happens. Every habit, even as simple as turning the light switch on, you go into a dark room. That's the cue. It's dark. Uh, you want to be able to see. That's the craving. You respond by turning the light on. The lights are on. That's the reward. Every habit that we do, good or bad, even habits you don't even think about, follow the cue, craving, response, and reward. That's what happens. James Clear says it this way, if the behavior is not rewarding, it's unlikely to be a habit. So to start a good habit, here's what Michelle, I'm going to do this quick because Michelle talked about this weeks ago. To start a good habit, here's what you need to do. You make the cue obvious, make the craving attractive, make the response easy, make the reward satisfying. That's how you start a good habit, okay? If uh, You can go back two weeks and, and listen to what Michelle said about it, but some examples. If you want to start reading before bed, you put the book on your pillow before you leave for the day. When you come back, you're going to see it. It's an obvious cue. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to read that. You start with a book that might interest you, so you start to become, have a craving to it. You make it as easy as possible. I'm going to read one page. That's all I'm going to do. And then maybe give yourself a reward afterwards. Maybe you say, I want to watch YouTube. I want to watch YouTube after I read a couple pages of a book. That's how we start a good habit. You want to run when you get home? You put your sh running shoes at the door when you walk in from work. You see those. That's your cue. You run. You listen to your favorite music or your favorite podcast. That's, that's a, that gives you um, a better craving. It makes it attractive. You just run just a little bit. When you come home, you give yourself a reward for running. That's how you start good habits. The more you do this, the ha your habit will start to form. It will start to form in your mind. But if we are talking about stopping bad habits, what do we need to do? Well, we do the opposite. If you want to stop a bad habit, here's what you do. Make the cue invisible. Make the craving unattractive. Make the response difficult. And make the reward a consequence. If you want to stop a bad habit, that cue should become invisible. Maybe you want to stop eating desserts, so you throw the desserts away. You hide them. You put them somewhere that you don't see them. If you see them every day, you're, not, you're, you're going to want to eat them. You hide those. Make the cue invisible. You make the craving unattractive. Maybe you're trying to be off your phone a little more. So every time you start doing it, you think of yourself sitting there just on your phone. Like the other day I was, um, yesterday I was at my girl's um, dance recital, our, our dance practice, and I looked around and everyone was just sitting there on their phone, cause, and just like I was. And I was like, we all look so silly. Like we're, there's 20 people in this room. Not one person is, is not doing this. So think, maybe think of that. You make it unattractive. Um, you make the response difficult. There's something you want to stop doing. You put it in a hard spot because then if you want to do it, you got to go up there and go grab it and you put it in a hard spot maybe. Or maybe you make the reward a consequence. Make it a punishment of some sort. Here's what I've learned um, from doing this habit loop and thinking about this and reading the book and, and looking more when it comes to habits. The easiest thing to start with is the cue. If you start with that, with that trigger or that cue that, that makes you want to do that habit, if you start with that, then it becomes easier to eventually stop it. Craig Rochelle talks about five major cues that will lead us in the wrong direction. I'm going to go over these fairly quickly. Five major cues. First two are this, because they kind of go together. Place and time. This is a cue or a trigger that at sometimes the place or the time will lead you to do a bad habit. That's what happens. Think about your bad habit. Most likely, there's a specific time and a specific place that you do it. And your good habits, most likely, there's a specific time and a specific place that you do that. For example, you don't overeat at the gym. You do that at home or maybe at your parents' house, right? You don't do that. It's a specific place and time. You don't get drunk at work, but you will when you go to a party, specific place and time. You don't look at porn at church, but late at night when you're bored and lonely, you do specific place and time. We understand that. We understand that our, where our cues are, place and time. If you understand that, that then you can make those, those cues of things you're trying not to do unattractive or get rid of those. Make it more unattractive. Get rid of the cue. Number three, another uh, cue or, or trigger for us is our moods. Experts talk about um, HALT, 
H-A-L-T. That stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Some of you know it. Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Some of you don't have an H and an A. You have a ha. Okay? You're hangry. Okay? That's some of you. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When you get really hungry or when you get really angry, all of a sudden, you want to do that bad habit because you're mad or you're hungry, heaven forbid. So you want to do that bad habit. Maybe for you, when you get lonely, you have nothing else to do, so you do that bad habit. Maybe for you, you're, when you're tired, you're too, you're too tired, you don't have the strength to stop doing that bad habit, so you just do it instead. So experts say you need to halt when you're any of those things, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Halt. It's a mood that you are in. Number four, it's a moment. Sometimes a moment can trigger you to do the habit that you don't want to do. Maybe for you, when you go to the game, you always drink too much. When you watch the game, you always drink too much. It's a moment that always produces a result. Maybe for you, every time you get into a fight with your spouse, you call your friends and badmouth them, or her. Or you call your parents, or whoever you want to call, and you badmouth it. it, It's a mood that sets you up to do a habit you don't want to do. It's a moment. And number five, the last one, people. Certain people that you're with is a trigger. It's a cue. Here's what's incredible. Research has shown that the closer you are to someone, the more likely you are to be like them. The closer you are to people, the more likely you are to be like them. Proverbs says, says it this way, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. The people you are around will make you better or worse. So that means you want to be a healthier person, surround yourself with healthy people. You want to be physically healthy, surround yourself with people that are physically healthy. You want to be emotionally healthy, surround yourself with people that are emotionally healthy. If you are struggling with being healthy, the worst thing you can do is surround yourself with people that are just like you, just going to make you worse. People are a trigger. They're a cue. You want to be more disciplined? Surround yourself with people that are disciplined. Don't surround yourself with people that aren't. Surround yourself with people that are. You want to be godlier? Surround yourself with people who are godlier. If you surround yourself with people that aren't, you're going to go that direction. Research shows that the people you're around will start to change you. It's a trigger. It is a cue. My um, two best friends are my, my brother, and I don't tell him that because it's weird for me to say it, but my brother and my, um, my friend Topper. Um, I've known them forever. Frank's up there, but... Um, he's in the next, I, I told him this was his cue to come up, and he said, wow, that's hurtful. Okay. <laughs> my, my brother, um, I've known him since he was born, and my, my buddy Topper, I've known since I was in fifth grade, and we spent middle school and high school seeing each other every single day, and I mean it, every day. My, Topper would come over for dinner, I saw my brother every day. Um, they are the two close people in my life, I've, I, they've always, they both are my, were my best men, both of them. Uh, we've been best friends for a long time. We, we plan on being best friends the rest of our life. Both of those people, knowing them for as long as I have, they are both generous. They are both loving husbands. They are both disciplined. They are both selfless. It is easier for me to be a godly person when I'm around them. It just is. They influence me. The way that they handle their kids and Topper has a kid coming, the way that they treat their spouses, it's easier for me to treat my spouse better when I see the way they treat their spouses. I surround myself with people who are godly. It makes me a better person. Some of you can't break a habit because you're surrounding yourself with people who are encouraging your habit. You have to break it off. Listen, it's impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. Your friends determine the direction of your life. It doesn't mean we don't love them. It doesn't mean any, it means that we protect ourselves and understand that our friends influence us. And because we understand that, we put the right people close to us that can influence us. Throughout this series, um, we've been talking about refocusing from what we do to who we are. That's been the main thing we've been talking about. We need to look at who do you want to be, what we've been talking about. Some of us, um, we have made our bad habit just who we are. It's our identity. And because our bad habit is now our identity, who we are, we create a process or, cre- or we create a system that gives us exactly what we identify as. I'll give you an example. Some of you would say, I'm just not a morning person. Now, before I say any of this stuff, 
this is the most hypocritical thing I'm going to say today because I am not a morning person at all, okay? Every Sunday when I wake up, I think, is God really calling me to be a pastor? <laughs> because if it's this early, I don't know. I'm not, I get it. Some of you say, I'm just not, I'm not a morning person. Like, like it's a personality trait. Like it's, like it's our ethnicity. Like, I'm just not a morning person. That's just who I d- identify as. Where some of us say, you know what? I'm just not a morning person. Yeah, I stay up late watching Netflix all the time. Yeah, I'm on my phone until 1130. Yeah, I drink my last cup of coffee at 8 p.m. Yeah, I'm stressed out all day and I never repay. I never pray about it. I never release any of my stress any other way. Yeah, I never get ready for the next day. Yeah, I don't drink enough water all through the day. So I'm just not a morning person. Like, yeah, maybe your system has created the person you've identified as. Maybe it isn't your identity. Maybe it's a system you created. You know the example. I'm just not a godly person. I mean, I believe in God, but I just don't feel any connection at all. I don't feel like he's there. I don't feel, I just, I I believe in him, like, theologically, and that's about it. I'm just not a godly person. Yeah, I never read my Bible. Yeah, I never pray. Yeah, I don't give anything away. Um, I use everything for myself. Yeah, I listen to music that's bad for my soul. Yeah, I watch things that are bad for my mind. Yeah, I only do what makes me happy at all times. Yeah, I never practice selflessness. Yeah, I never serve anyone else. Yeah, I don't spend any time with God at any point, at any point of my day. I'm just not a godly person. Maybe you're, maybe you've seen the problem and you've created a pattern that has given you what you've identified as. Don't confuse your system with your identity. If you have a bad habit that you want to stop, if you have that, you can stop it. But you can't stop it if you've, if you've concluded that your system is who you are. I can give you so many more examples. My life is just so hectic. No, you're just always in a hurry. You created a system where you always are in a hurry, so now you identify as a hectic person. I'm just disorganized. No, you're lazy. You've created a system that has become your identity. I'm always the victim. No, you're selfishly pessimistic. You only see how you've been wronged at all times. You never see what anyone else did. You created a system that has now become your identity. Here's a hard one. I can't afford to tithe. Yeah, you're in church. You know I was going to eventually get there, right? I can't afford it. No, you're greedy. That's the difference. You think Myself, I don't know if you know my job. I'm a church planner pastor, and my wife is a teacher. I don't know if you know how money works. They don't, they don't get paid a lot. Do you think we, we can afford it? Like, oh, yeah, we don't, this 10%, we, it, we don't need it. We'll just throw it. No. Everyone here that ties says, no, I could use that. The difference is two things. We do it because, one, it's obedience. If you read, and I'm talking here to, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, I'm not talking to you, okay? I'm talking to people that say, I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. The Bible says it's obedience. It doesn't say, hey, maybe you should tithe. No, no. If you don't tithe, you're being disobedient to me. If you do not give any of your money away, you're being disobedient to me. And number two, it creates a heart of generosity. It, creates, it breaks the, ch- the chains of greed in your heart and makes you have to give something away. It creates a heart of generosity. You created a system that has now become your identity. I just can't afford to do that. And we like to just say it's who we are. Or even worse, I hear this. It's the devil attacking me. You give the devil way too much credit. Maybe it's not the devil. Maybe it's just a terrible system you created that's giving you the exact results that you currently have. Maybe that's what it is. The good news is, if it's a system problem and not an identity problem and not who you are, that means you can change your system. But it takes starting godly habits and it takes breaking bad habits. It's what it takes. So again, I'm going to ask you this question, then we're going to sing. Who do you want to be? Whoever that person is, what do you need to do to be that person? What is that godly habit you need to start to be that person? And what is that habit that's preventing you from being that person? What's that habit, that one habit you're going to leave here today saying, I'm going to stop doing this? I'm going to figure out my cue. I'm going to figure out what triggers me to do it. I'm going to stop doing this. You're going to go home, and worship, you can start coming on up. When you leave, here's what I want all of you to do. I'm saying this to everyone, so you have to talk to each other. I want you to talk to either a friend or a spouse or whoever you came with and say, here's the bad habit I'm going to work on stopping. Now there's no excuse, okay? I'm looking at you spouses, okay? Check with them. Be like, when you leave, be like, hey, what, what is it? What do you want to stop? Hold, hold each other accountable. Then talk about, okay, what are the things that make it easier for me to do that? If you're not, if you're not married and you're single, find a friend and say, here's the bad habit I want to stop. 
What are those bad habits that you need to stop? Because if we want to be the person God's calling us to be, there are habits that we need to break, that we need to stop. We're not going to make excuses. We're not going to identify as them anymore. We're going to say, no, nope, it's a system that I can change, and I'm going to work to change. And year after year after year, when I add good habits, I take away bad habits, I will slowly continue to be morphed into the person God is calling me to be. That's called holiness. It's working in holiness. With that, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being a God who paid the price for all of the things we've done wrong, for our bad habits, for the things that we struggle with. Thank you for being the God that loves us so much you sent your son for us. Dear God, I pray that you convict people today, whatever that one bad habit is that you want them to work on now. We understand that you love us not because of what we do, but because of who we are. We also understand that because we are your son and your daughters, because that's who we are, we're going to work to look more like you, to deny ourselves, to put our sinful past behind us, to get rid of any habits that do not match the person you want us to be. God, I pray that you convict us today, give us clear indication of our next steps, help us have the courage to tell somebody about what we're trying to stop, and help us to look more like you and how we live. In your son's name. Let's sing, let's sing this closing song together.